Thank you very much. This is my six-year-old son, William. In case it's not obvious, the thing on his back is a jet pack. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, he said to me, Dad, Mum, when you're dead, can we have your boat? He really did. I was thrilled. Actually, I was thrilled because he was thinking about his siblings, not just himself. He said, we. And he was thinking long term. At least I hope he was. <laughs> the, great, the great thing about kids is that they are bold enough and imaginative enough and connected enough to make the most of a rapidly changing world. If there's one lesson from the last 20 years, it's that bold imagination can become transformational reality amazingly quickly. In Silicon Valley, the world's top 20 technology companies have created nearly $2 trillion worth of value in only about 15 years. They were founded by a bunch of college kids, powered by pizza and Red Bull. They worked in garages. They hated the status quo. Some of them didn't even wear shoes. And yet they have created some of the most successful, some of the most influential, some of the most powerful businesses ever seen in the history of the world. In the words of Steve Jobs, they were prepared to think different. So, when I was invited to speak today, I was also absolutely thrilled. I believe that a high-speed rail network is the critical piece of infrastructure that is transformational in nature and that will be built in Australia in my lifetime. I really believe it is the critical piece of transformational national infrastructure to be built in this country in the next 100 years. I also believe that high-speed rail can be delivered and financed by the private sector with limited, perhaps no, government support. You may think that I'm smoking something. So let me just take a step back. I was born, for those of you that don't know me, in Colombia, in Bogota. I grew up in the Middle East and the UK and I've lived and worked in something like 25 different countries around the world. Many of those countries are planning or already have a high-speed rail network. By education, I'm a scientist, and I've studied how people make decisions in business and government and science for the last couple of thousand years. They aren't always brilliant at it. My background in business lies very much in the numbers. I'm a chartered accountant. I've spent my whole career pretty much in finance and investment banking and long-term strategic thinking. I've worked on hundreds of M&A transactions and financing transactions worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So today I have got three ambitions. The first is for you to go home today believing that I am not completely mad when I say that high-speed rail could be privately financed and delivered in the relatively near term. The second is for you to wake up tomorrow morning and think, what if Nigel is actually right? What if we could deliver this network with private finance and it could be up and running within a decade or so? Imagine if someone else solved that problem for us and we could move beyond the hypothetical debate to talking about how it became real. That surely would be politically incredibly attractive. And the final point is for you to decide sometime this week that the time has come to champion the delivery of this network, starting now, with a really strong focus on the transformational impact it would have on this country over the long term would turn Australia into a truly connected, cohesive 21st century country like nothing else can.
The challenge I have that here in Australia is that the conventional wisdom is that this is more or less unthinkable. We've had a couple of presentations from people who believe in the logic of high-speed rail but cannot believe that it could ever be delivered or financed other than with almost complete government support. It's a bit of a gauntlet has been thrown down there, so I will pick it up and hopefully I don't offend too many people along the way. We've already seen the maps of Australia and the population and how it will grow. Most people in Australia live in large cities. They are wonderful cities, but I have yet to meet anyone who talks about how the transport in their cities and the facilities in their cities are getting wondrously better year by year. Most people complain of the opposite. So it's just interesting to note that the population of the Osaka prefecture, when the original system was built in Japan in 1964, was just 6 million people. The population of Tokyo was 10 to 12 million people. The populations are not that different. We've seen that our populations will grow, and even today they are not much different from those numbers from Japan 50 years ago. We've also talked a bit about geography, so it's interesting to compare just the physical scale of the problem, and these maps, thanks to the wonders of Google Maps, are supposed to be the scale, between the eastern or southeastern seaboard of Australia, and I do deliberately have this going at least as far north as Newcastle, you'll be pleased to note, with Spain. It's not physically very different. The same, for what it's worth, is true of Western Japan and the networks there. People often say there is not enough traffic in Australia. And again, we have talked about this this morning. These are two of the busiest air routes in the world. We have large urban centres inhabited by people with plenty of money to spend on transport. So we have the population and we have the potential revenues. The BZE report, again talked about this morning, has been very helpful in fleshing out that there is potentially significant upside in some of these numbers. Other countries have got networks of a similar size to Australia, and they are alive and they are well. They have growing passenger numbers, and they are making money. So we have the population, we have the geometry, we have the spending power. We have the right basic factors in place. I don't think anyone has disagreed with that. But from a financing point of view, we ought to start out with the basic presumption that this project really could be financed, really could be commercially and financially viable, and then work back from there. To be honest, thinking anything different is like turning down the motorway and driving the wrong way down the motorway and cursing everyone who's coming the other way. The prize, Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman has a very famous algorithm for solving difficult problems. Write down the problem, think really hard about it, then write down the answer. He won a Nobel Prize, perhaps he's allowed to say this kind of thing, but this, the serious point the wise, the wise problem solver knows is getting the right problem written down in the first place. As a banker, I know that despite all the detailed analysis that may have been done, at the end of the day, whether a project is commercially or financially viable will come down to a few numbers. These are the only things which matter if you really want to understand not just the commercial and financial viability but also the risks inherent in the project. It's worth saying this is something that investment bankers are not terribly good at doing. The trick is to figure out which those numbers are and where the variations really lie. For high-speed rail, as we know, it really isn't very difficult. The starting point is build cost. Various different numbers have been talked about, and if we take the Sydney to Melbourne route, it may be $40 billion to $50 billion, maybe slightly less than that. But from a financing point of view, they're in an order of magnitude Actually, it doesn't matter very much to the overall returns. The numbers are reasonably well-defined. 
The next in my mind is operating costs. This is quite a small number year by year, and that is critical because the point is the marginal profitability of rail is very high. So this means the returns are incredibly highly leveraged to the assumptions you make about passenger numbers. It's worth saying that the running costs and the maintenance costs are pretty well understood and pretty well modelled, so you can have a reasonably high degree of confidence in them. So it's no surprise that the critical figures here, really, are the passenger volumes and ticket prices. This is the billion dollar, or tens of billions of dollars, question. If we can solve it, then Australia truly can enter the 21st century. From a banker's perspective, there is a lot of data about traffic on the route. There's lots of comparisons with what has happened in other places around the world. There's lots of data about induced traffic volumes. I don't want to go into all of that nitty-gritty today because I think if we do, we end up going round and round in circles. What I do want to say is that from the work done by BZE and others, the numbers look like they're very much fixed in the reports that have been done at the low end and that there is significant upside. The analysis looks like prices have been set at a significant discount to average ticket prices. I personally believe that is unlikely. Secondly, the presumption is made that penetration into Sydney-Melbourne traffic will remain relatively low at 50 or 60 or low 60s percent. But ask yourself this question, if you're the airlines and you've lost 50 percent market share, how are you going to maintain your current schedule? You can't. So you'll be running half the schedule. Will you still win all the business traffic with half the schedule? It's, I think there's a very binary equation there and outcomes much closer to 80 percent seen for similar peer cities, I think are actually much more likely. It's worth saying that traditional financial modelling techniques don't do well in the face of this level of uncertainty. There have been plenty of financing disasters. For the last 10 years or so, we've used really a next generation approach to explore these risks. It uses advanced statistical analysis really to understand the distributions not just which are likely or central cases, but the entire distribution of outcomes. We use Monte Carlo simulations to explore what this means from a financing and valuation point of view. For those that are engineers, you use these techniques every day. Very few buildings or bridges fall down. Hardly any bankers have ever used these techniques at all, and it isn't amazing how many financial structures have fallen down in the last 20 years. It's no surprise. I think with the right inputs and the right analysis, some very different answers would emerge where you would understand the upside scenarios much more clearly. We would clearly love to have the chance to do that analysis. The good news, though, is we don't need to solve these problems all on our own. Most of the world's top 20 economies are either planning or are building high-speed rail networks or are operating them already. A number of Australia's closest economic partners have deep experience in building and operating such networks and in using them to generate financial and economic returns and social prosperity. All I believe we need to do here in Australia to move this debate off the drawing board and into real life is just two words. Yes, please. We need our business leaders and political leaders, leaders to say to our nation's friends, yes, please, we welcome your input and support in identifying how best to finance and deliver Australia's high-speed rail network. I, for one, will not be at all surprised at how quickly they respond. Just those two words. Australia has been open for business in many senses of those words across governments of both political persuasions for decades. 
but to be open to business with Asian friends in particular, we need to remember that doing business in Asia involves some invitation, not just sitting back and waiting. It's not just, as we've heard this morning, it's not just about the geographic and demographic logic. It's not just about whether it turns out to be the financially sound case that I believe it will. It's not even about the transformational economic benefits for Australia over the long term in becoming truly connected. It's not even about doing what has been done in the UK and France and Germany and Italy and China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan and others beyond. It is about people. Think of the undergraduate pursuing a long-held dream to study in another state. Bring him closer to his childhood friends. The grandparent living in the Gold Coast. Bring him or her closer to the laughter of grandchildren. The family relocating interstate as the husband and wife pursue their careers. Bring them closer to a life which remains just as connected and full and rich as if they were living in their home city or their hometown or their home village. For too long, Australia has seen itself as located at the end of the world. For too long, Australia has seen itself as a poor relation to larger, richer countries in the West and North. For too long, Australia has somehow believed that it just does not deserve the same infrastructure that is taken for granted in many other major countries. And yet the facts tell us the exact opposite. We've heard this morning Australia has some of the best heavy rail infrastructure in the world. Our technology is amongst the highest capacity, the most reliable, the most cost efficient in the world. It's the product of long-term thinking by our resources companies and the governments that have supported them. We need to take the same approach to the long-term productivity of our people as we have taken to our infrastructure. Australia is now the 12th largest economy globally. Indeed, much of our... It used to be, and I love this, this is an amazing fact, 20 years ago, Australia was 30% the size of the economy of the original mother nation, the UK. Today, it is 60% of the size of the UK. No other Western economy has achieved that growth in that period of time. But long-term thinking is essential if we want to see that economic prosperity continue. Australia has quite a few of the world's most livable cities. Much of our population lives in them. We're the most urbanised major developed country. Long-term thinking is essential if we want to maintain the quality of life in those cities as the country grows. So, most of our cities owe their location to historical accident. The need for fresh water and a place to park your boat when you've travelled from the other end of the world. Brisbane, Sydney, Newcastle, Melbourne, they're all the same. They are there by accident of fresh water and a safe harbour. We now have the opportunity to make decisions to choose our destiny. If we do, we have the opportunity to transform our nation. That is why I always say that the long term starts tomorrow, the title of my speech. In fact, I believe this so strongly, I even wrote a book about it. Mike Baird kindly said about it, it is a must for any manager, leader or minister. Six months later, he became premier. So maybe there is some magic in it after all. We don't often think about the long term. But if my son William leaves to his, lives to his average life expectancy, in 2100 you will be able to invite him back to the 75th anniversary celebrations for Australia's high-speed rail network. So long as we start now. 
The long term may feel like it's a long way in the future, but if you look up and out, the future is already here. In the words of William Gibson, it just isn't evenly distributed yet. So if we want the future, all we need to do is reach out and grasp it, both metaphorically and in how we think. High-speed rail transport could be that future. What we need now is not money, not even courage, it's not even vision. All we really need is those two words. Yes, please. Thank you very much.